Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Swedenborg in Life. Today we're going to be talking about the future of religion. Our topics will be broken down as follows. Number one, what religion is about. Two, what religion isn't about. Three, the future and the garden. Okay, so we've got this big complex thing called religion. And probably most of you showing up to this have some kind of reaction to that word. Oh, I'm spiritual, not religious. Some people see it as an essential pillar of human life and society. Others see it as outdated and counterproductive. Some people credit it with saving their lives, while others are quick to point out the problems it's caused in society. Everybody's got an opinion on it, but it's hard to define it. Even the dictionary definition has the words, especially when, usually, and often in it. And it's just as hard to envision where it's headed. Is it about to collapse? Is it about to experience a revival? What would that look like? It's a tricky subject to get a handle on, but we're going to try our best here today. Stay tuned. So if you heard a little, like, ex explosion noise during my opening monologue. Um, it's nothing to be worried about, it's my phone. But if you didn't hear it, everything went off smoothly. Why are, why are you even asking? <laughs> my name is Curtis, happy to have you guys here. I'm with the Swedenborg Foundation, nonprofit group that looks to get Swedenborg's ideas out into the conversation with the hopes that that conversation can do some good. My guest today is the Reverend Anna Wolfenden, who is the pa founder and pastor of the Garden Church. Thanks for being on the show, Anna. It's so great to be here. All right, it's great to have you, and I'm excited. We're going to talk about some interesting, fun sort of things here. And you guys at home can join in the conversation. The second half of the show will all be sort of a live question and answer. So write those in now. And we'll try to get to them then if, if when we're going through you something that that doesn't make sense or oh i want to know more about that or i have a better opinion on that get it in and we'll take a look at it all right let's get to our topic number one So if we're going to talk about religion and what's the future of religion, we've got to have some kind of framework. What, what is this thing? And it's just going to complicate things when I, when I read this quote because Swedenborg sort of has his own definitions for all terms that he uses. So let's take a little look at, at how he defines religion. Religion is all about how we live, and the religious way to live is to do good. And that quote, you might, if you're at home, you might say, why are all those words capitalized? You guys messed that up. There's no period. Um, that's because it's the title of the very first section. Swedenborg has this book, which is free download, Swedenborg.com. There's first part of it's called The Doctrine of Life. Oh, sorry, microphone. First part of it's called The Doctrine of Life. And he starts out this thing called The Doctrine of Life with a title that, that is that quote. So it must be pretty important in talking about religion. So religion is all about how we live, and the religious way to live is to do good. And you had told me that that was sort of an important quote in your in the church that, that you started. So what does that quote mean to you? Yeah, so at the Garden Church, we're really reimagining what it can look like to be church, and this is a guiding principle for mm -hmm. us. Um, I don't know, in my experience, church has been a lot of different things, and a lot of it's been about what you believe or being a certain way or having a certain framework of how how it is to um, be religious or, or wardrobe or wardrobe, wardrobe. Yeah. yeah yeah or ideology or mm -hmm. all sorts of things um and i just this quote has always grabbed me because it kind of flips it all upside down and it's really about right. like how do you live your life that matters and makes you be part of of the definition of a religion rather than like an idea yeah and we would sort of casually make religious distinctions based on ideas you know that what do, what do you believe are you know are you a christian or not a christian well what do you believe you know yeah. that sort of thing and i you know he doesn't just mention this idea of re religion is about life in that little book i just held up i mean that it saturates Zero. his material i mean is, is there a bigger concept for him than right that? i mean there's that great there's a great quote that swedenborg talks about when people enter into like life after death that there's and they're not asked what is your religion, but what is your life? And yes. I just think there's something so core about that, that yes, like the principles and the values of religion matter, but it doesn't matter for an intellectual, solely intellectual or um, belief oriented, but really that it's a live belief. It's really knowing that what you know is motivating a life that is being transformed. Yeah, and it's this sort of balancing act because he doesn't say that it doesn't matter what ideas you have. Nope. But then again, 
if those ideas aren't applied or aren't joined with love and good actions, you might as well not have them. So it's this tricky sort of middle ground, you know? It's a both and. Yeah, it's a both and. Totally. It's absolutely a both and. Um, and I, I just think that um, it's interesting that he puts, yeah, doing good, you know, which you know, living, living kindly, living lovingly is, is the essential thing. And that it's almost seems like uh, ideas, if they can serve as a tool to get you there, that's when they're, uh, you know, pulling their weight. Right. And they have a purpose. It's not to just, you know, blindly go out and do whatever in the world, but to really have that continual relationship between love and wisdom or, you know, truth and good that there's, they're in relationship with each other and that they are joined together into useful service. So I think that, that, um, continual process of engaging the ideas mm -hmm. and then moving forward with them um, is something that's just all over Swedenborg's work. Yeah, and he, you know, Swedenborg is all about. If you if you guys crack open Swedenborg at any point, you'll always see this duality: love and wisdom, uh, good and truth, um, faith. Uh, you know, anyway, faith and charity. Faith and charity. Yep. Right, exactly. Um, we just made a little music video about that. How that how often that comes up, and um, and so you'll sort of see that. Um, for him, it's kind of the sweet spot when the two come together. Absolutely. And so if you have these religious concepts, like, you know, this idea of God, okay, there is a uh, higher power, you know, goodness and truth, uh, the ability to, to genuinely love people, all that, it comes into me, you know, as a gift. If you can understand that and believe that and act lovingly from it, that's like the sweet spot. You know, Absolutely. The, you know the, the concept is nice to have or, or acting lovingly nice to have, but once you have these two, then you the ceiling kind of goes away. You can really get deeper and deeper in and kind of walking through, for me, walking through Swedenborg and picking up all these little factoids and the, the new, I, I, every show I say the word nuance. It's one of my like most fancy vocabulary words. All these little nuances of the, the spirituality he describes, the spiritual reality he describes, um, they kind of give you this way to navigate, um, but really it's about making sure that you are being loving while you're using those concepts. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that we talk a lot about is it's not to not have those guiding principles. I mean, so for example, at our church, we are kind of redefining what worship is and kind of blurring mm -hmm. the lines and broadening it. And we always work together and worship together and eat together. And so we have what you might typically think of as like a church experience with singing and praying and, and the songs and, mm -hmm. and uh, sermons. And that's really key because that informs, but we're also like working side by side and then we're sharing in this meal. And I think what happens is just what you're describing is you start to see those sweet spots. Like as you're like, looking at this little plant and thinking about like kind of the physicality of the usefulness that it might feed somebody yeah there's like a spiritual principle in there and then you can talk about like how does that apply to your life and and that's just one of the beautiful things that i find in swedenborg's works is it's always on multiple layers like yeah. the, the truth applies on you know the literal level but also on these deeper levels these higher spiritual levels and that willingness to like keep doing that cycle and that mm -hmm. up and down piece um, I think keeps that alive and you can find those sweet spots. You can find the places where it can come together and then blossom and bloom. Yeah. Garden analogies, I just, they're all over the place. We're, we're, and that won't be the last one we use tonight. And it makes me think, yeah, well, we, you know, we, we do this correspondences meditation every week and the idea that you can be working with something physical like a plant, but from that, from noticing how it works, you can learn these sort of spiritual truths about life. And so, yeah, I know that people who... You know that religion has this gathering element to it, and the people who are that I've talked to who are don't like religion or even anything spiritual still say, "Ooh, that there's good community there." Like that's hard to to duplicate that yeah. community. So, how do we? And we'll be looking more as we go on with this conversation. But yeah, how do you get the good stuff and not the bad stuff? So let's uh, let's move to segment two. All right, so part two, what religion isn't about, because um, I thought that would be cute to have two segments that were very similar. And I forgot to say, if you have questions or comments about that first section, uh, get them in. Remember, we have our live stuff coming up. So let's go to a quote for this segment. T today, people describe the church, and today in Swedenborg's day was like 1750, 60, something like that. 
Today, people describe the church solely in terms of religious teachings, which they use as a means of distinguishing among the Lord's churches. They do not care how adherents of those churches live, whether they nurse hatred for each other, rip each other apart like wild animals, rob each other, strip each other of all reputation and status and wealth, or privately deny all that is holy. Yet the church can never exist in such people. It exists instead in people who love the Lord, love their neighbor as themselves, have a conscience, and oppose the kinds of hatred mentioned. And that quote for me, and we we used this on a show like 4,000 weeks ago, um, so I thought it was time to recycle it. Uh, but that to me kind of gets at this dynamic, which I, I have I've thought of trying to write some kind of video about or something. But right now we kind of say, okay, so there are like Christians and, and Muslims and, the, you know, the, we kind of div, div, divide people based on belief structure. But when you make that the barrier to entry, I mean, that, the things he's describing in there, like people who, who say I'm religious and do all kinds of horrible things, that's everybody, most people who dislike religion dislike it because of those people, you know, or because of those actions. So there's, but that's sort of what you're destined to get if you say, okay, you want, you want to be part of this group? The, the barrier to entry is, do you subscribe to these principles or do you profess them or something? But if it was, if you were somehow other to say, it's kind of like, um, I don't know, I, don't, I can't think of a, a tight analogy for it. But if it was a, you know, you got to show that you're living a certain way, then you could be considered something like this. Well, I don't know if it's a tight analogy, but what I like to use the analogy of is often religious organizations throughout history, it's been about having a fence around it, you know, barrier. What, yeah. How do you, how do you belong? The question is like, mm -hmm. how do I belong to this group? Is it what you believe, et cetera? I think there's a new way of forming community that really is coming, is sweeping across across denominations, across Christendom, and that it's more about being a magnet. And so I talk about it, but it's like we have the table in the middle that has, you know, it has it has the word, it has the vibe, the yeah. food. It has, I mean, it's something that's drawing us together. It has the vision. It's it's you know, love and wisdom together. Whatever you want to put in the middle, but some experience of God, and people are being drawn to it. So to belong, you want to be your to belong, you need to be moving towards it or wanting to move towards it. Yeah. And it draws us together. And the belonging doesn't come from what fence you jump over, but the quality of your life. You know, that you're living this way of loving the Lord and loving the neighbor. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's sort of a shift that's happening across all aspects of culture. Like it, going from this like yep. top down threat based force, you know, like back in the, you know, that, that famous sermon, uh, Sinners in the hands of an angry God by whoever William so and so and like it, it's just the whole thing is like how much God is wanting to put us in hell and and so it was sort of a fear-based economy you come to church to get, and it was sort of threat but this the, what you're describing there is just kind of the new way to do things like there's there's no there's no penalty if you don't show up um, we're providing something this magnet that hopefully brings something into your life that, that is tangibly affecting it in a good way and then and and we're not in charge we are not in charge of your salvation. We're not um, telling you how you have to be, but come, and if it's good, people come. Because nowadays, people don't feel like they have to go to church. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, there's a recent study that was done that the fastest growing religious classification in the U.S. is the spiritual but not religious. I mean, this yeah. is like statistically proven, but it doesn't mean that people necessarily don't want to be part of communities that are loving God and loving each other. Yeah. But, you know, the classifications, uh, they don't, mean positive things to most people or they're right. just bland i mean they're just irrelevant well what has worse branding issues than the word religion or church or something you know like you think about all these scandals that come out all the violence all these killings you know it's a, it's you know you 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 would definitely want to say okay yeah i maybe i'm open to these higher principles you know but i'm not that i'm not like that you absolutely know? i mean i'm the weird one like in my generation most of my friends many of which were raised in church raised with positive things they have want nothing to do with it. And they're like, what's wrong with you? Like, why are you yeah. sticking with it? Yeah. And I mean, the reason I'm sticking with it is is not because I want to be part of the judgment and the boring and bland, but because I actually still believe there is something about bringing people together to love God and love the neighbor. But I think we need to reimagine it. We need to do it in new ways. And we need yeah. to like engage these teachings the way Swedenborg says, like, there is a new way of being Christian. There's a new way of being religious. There are new ways of gathering together. Right. Yeah. And I'm so 
I'm part of the Swedenborg Foundation, which is a nonprofit, but yet still, we're talk, we talk, we do this show and we talk about things like God and heaven and angels. And like when I was first starting to put this stuff on Facebook, I was like so embarrassed. I didn't want anyone to know that I was <laughs> doing that because there's so many bad connotations with it. And right. uh, now I like it and I like the, the sort of trying to make products that even people who are outside that realm will be like, okay, well, it's not my scene, but I don't hate it. You totally. know, something like Try that. adding a rev to your name. Yeah. Let yeah. Me just right. tell you, it's like worst pickup line ever. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On that note, let's move to our third topic. And wait, wait, wait. Stop. Don't move. Questions. If you, if you have any questions or comments about that section, you have any thoughts on the future of religion, get them in there. We're going to have our live question segment soon. So, I call this one the future and the garden because the garden church, uh, Reverend Anna Woofenden, Reverend is a uh, is um, we still think you're cool. Uh, awesome. Is is here at, you know as sort of founder of that. I just want to I want to read a quote from Swedenborg that you said had been kind of a uh, an important one when you were you were putting this thing together. So this is from the book True Christianity. God created us in such a way that our inner self is in the spiritual world and our outer self is in the physical world. So that the spiritual part of us, which belongs in heaven, could be planted in the physical part belonging to this world, the way a seed is planted in the ground. And so, your the the uh, the church that you you've started has a lot to do with gardening, right? It does. Yeah, we're actually looking to create a communal garden space as an outdoor worship space and have a church without walls, busting Mm -hmm. out and really looking at like how can we gather around community gardening and being connected with the earth, but more importantly, or alongside, it's the playground for being a community gathering place and being a place where people's spiritual lives can be nurtured and being a place that can really acknowledge and connect that people are hungry physically, but also hungry emotionally and for community Mm -hmm. and hungry spiritually. And so this interconnectedness and this way of um, just seeing that the spiritual reality is infused into the physical reality and yeah. being able to point to that. And that's a great thing if you're, you know, doing making a church based on Swedenborg stuff because he was he was all about gardening. He has all these kinds of analogies of and how that you know, you're talking about food and that he's saying spiritually, you know, love or good and truth as he's put that is spiritual water and food and so yeah. to have this sort of natural component there too. So that's and so you where where is your church? Our church is in LA in San Pedro. Um, and right now we're actually meeting in different public parks and partnering with different um, community garden projects. Mm-hmm. And we're searching for this plot of land that we're gonna, um, we're looking for abandoned lots. It's a whole process, but yeah. um, our, our long-term goal is to have this, um, a spot that um, we can really transform into this urban sanctuary. And part of our guiding um, thought theologically so Swedenborg talks about how the Bible or the word has a whole arc to it so there's all these individual stories but there's also this this complete arc and so you think about like Garden of Eden Genesis very beginning of the Bible yep so you start in a garden but it's this kind of pristine garden it's outside and it's wonderful there's good things about the garden that's set apart the very end of the book of Revelation the very end of the Bible last two chapters he talks about this heavenly city and in the middle of the city is where we find the garden elements. There's this river of the water of life, Mm -hmm. and there's a tree of life that has fruit, 12 kinds, one for every month, so food all the time, and then these leaves that heal the nation. So actually we start every worship service by um, holding up an icon of the tree of life and just remembering that we're planting ourselves right smack dab in the middle of the city, in the middle of um, an area that, that has has needs people are physically hungry yep um and looking to really be part of part of that growing tree of life where people can be fed and nourished and where healing can happen that sounds cool and it's pretty fun yeah so it's, it's good so far and oh you just gosh. started it up right i mean it's yeah right we started september 1st yeah so we're like just little tiny baby plant yeah but potential is great and people are coming and it's it's really it's pretty miraculous it's yeah a good time yeah well it's cool and i appreciate hearing about it and i there's so many different directions we could go in with this particular episode of this show i mean some people who know swedenborg well 
we're here talking about the future of religion, and they might say, why aren't you talking about the new church? Like Swedenborg talks about this whole, like, what the future of religion is going to be like. But I thought I wanted to bring you in because here we're seeing a specific form that, that somebody is trying, and that you've got, you've got these kind of principles, and you're trying to create something that you know that the issue is with traditional religion. Here's, let's make something that's really caring for people on a literal and a spiritual level. And so I just wanted to show rather than tell. Um, so I really I'm appreciate saying. hearing about that. And we're gonna, will you stick around for some question and answer Absolutely. stuff? Absolutely. All right, cool. Everybody get your questions in there and we're gonna answer them on the other side of this quick video break. So now is the part of the conversation that includes everybody at home. This is our question and answer period. Our topic again is the future of religion. If you want to have questions about what we just talked about, about that, about anything else that's bothering you, get them in. Write them in on uh, YouTube, on Facebook, anything like that, and, and we'll get to them. All right, so let's take a look here. So this is from Zach on Facebook. Did Swedenborg try to start a church or to start his own religious denomination? And that is a very good question. Very good question. Um, my answer is no. Um, he never, for so he he was just a normal person until and you can you can correct me on any of this, but until <laughs> until uh, mid fifties he was just hanging out inventing. Well, normal as in like one of the top scientists in the world. Right. He started to have these revelatory experiences and so when he started to have all these spiritual experiences and kind of getting things together. But when when he was in that period, for then to the end of his life, he was an author. I mean, he he never organized like any kind of meeting. He never held church services or anything like that. He was describing what he called the new church, but he was really just trying to reform the current Christian church and disseminate these ideas. Even originally, he was just like anonymous, like he didn't even publish. So he he never said, "Okay, I'm gonna. This is the church, Swedenborg's church, and we're gonna." start it here and i'm going to be the pastor and then there's going to be so that's the way i that i remember yeah, it similarly um yeah i think it's actually a really important thing to remember it is that when he died there nobody was gathering together and trying to be a church mm -hmm. and in fact it was it was after his death that people started to gather together like in reading groups in london and there was this whole conversation of so we like these ideas it's kind of reforming the idea of what we see church as being as christianity as being and half the people were like, let's take this back to our church. Is And then the other half were like, let's start our own. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just honestly, it's still an interesting question to this day. Yeah. But it's, I mean, lots of denominations are like this. Lutherans have Luther and, yeah. you know, Methodists have, have you know, well, I mean, like it goes on and on. But yeah, um, yeah and people are continue. It, it's, it's always a balancing act. Yeah. How do you take all this material that, I said balancing act twice in this episode then, didn't I? Okay. You, you so have is it to, a nuanced balancing act? It's a nuanced... Hey, you picked that up very quickly. You picked up the nuances of my, mm -hmm. my talking <laughs> style. So people are taking... There's so much information that Swedenborg wrote. How do we live around this? You know, how do you make this something that you can incorporate? And, and yeah, and people have tried different... Yeah, let's, let's graft it into existing religious bodies. Let's start a new church around it. Or let's... Or and I, I know a lot of large contributions to sort of the Swedenborgian movement have come from people who weren't part of any organization, Helen Keller's yeah. of the world, you know, who just sort of found it on their own. So I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what does it look like in, in 30 years. Do you? I have no idea, but I'm interested <laughs> in it. Yeah. I also think that Swedenborg described so many things that are these amazing, beautiful, large principles that are true so we see a lot of things happening in the world and there's a lot you know we talk a lot about Swedenborg's influence but to me what I'm really interested in is where are these places where church in in the most essential way is showing up mm -hmm. and we talked a little bit earlier about like what what does it mean to be church and right. Swedenborg just talks I mean every place he talks about it there's a different definition you know it's yes. anything from like the church it is like like each person is a church in miniature to like the church universal all places where people are coming together exactly. and love god and love the neighbor or and so i think it's um the question i think is really important to ask because i think swedenborg's talking about something much 
much larger than any specific denomination or organized group. Yes, it's true. And I, I'm interested to see how the whole thing plays out. Yeah, we'll, me too. we'll see. We'll thanks. check back in 30 years. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Zach. Great question. Let's get to our next one. Uh, this is from Question on YouTube. Religion has often been the source of war. How can such a good thing be the root of such conflict? Mm, that's a great um, question. And it's a great question, and obviously it would be on anyone's mind if you're going to talk about religion. You've got to address it. And Swedenborg... Is, is there anything he spends more time doing than, um, you know, getting at the flaws of the church of his day, right? I mean, he's all, he's all about, like, and we saw in that, in our second quote, he's saying that, you know, there's these people who are in a church, but um, they act horribly towards each other. And he'll often say, like, in his spiritual experiences, uh, you know, in the afterlife, he'll say, you know, actually, religious people are usually even worse than other people there. You find out because deep, because people see religion and they say, ooh, that's a means for control, or they'll use it to reinforce their kind of us and them mentality. Um, and I sort of see in the first quote, the religious way to live is to do good. So what we're seeing out there, the sort of organized religions that we kind of, those aren't actually the real thing. That's kind of like a, a proxy of it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's a really it's a really good and tough question, and I think it's something that we need to wrestle with. Um, I had a day when I was um, in seminary and to be trained to, to be a minister. I had a day in church history, and you know we're going over you know crusades, all these awful things. And I texted mm-hmm. a friend, and I literally said like, I don't think I can be a Christian. Yeah, you know, I'm like, how can I be part of this tradition? And then immediately the thing that came back, you know, as we were processing was actually if I am a Christian, if I am a religious person, if I'm choosing that, I better be part of like acknowledging how it's been harmful and being able to own that and see that and and then be part of it being something different. But I just think, I mean, it's tough. Any kind of organization you have is made up of humans. Yeah. And there are those, those um, and we're, we're human, we're flawed. And I think that's where Swedenborg's works can be a good mirror for us mm-hmm. you know we can like, okay where in me uh, is there something that's taking over that's about power and control or violence where in my community where in you know you know an organization and do what Swedenborg talks about is like self-examination like this really looking at it and saying like where's that coming from and um you know how, how do we make that change so I think the churches as a whole and religion as a whole have a lot of repentance to do and I think yeah. that's an important piece of the process yeah, definitely, and and you know, always everything's always more complicated, you know, than than it seems, and uh, you know, we sort of have this idea. You know, Swedenborg talks about back in the like you know, the historical stuff in the Bible. You have a lot of really bad actions being committed by you know ancient churches and those kinds of things. And he says that even though those people were doing bad things for bad reasons, somehow. God was turning it into good through like representation. It's all it all gets very complex there. So Absolutely. I don't know. And you know, and the way I think he would put it too is that the the bad things people do, be you know, some people think it's because of religion. I think you know his take would be a little more like there is that evil in human nature. So yeah. it or or in in some nature, and it it expresses itself through that. That if if you didn't have it, you'd still have that evil but there's a there's obviously a huge debate yeah 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 yeah. so and Swedenborg talks about that you know nothing not the least thing can happen that some good cannot come out of it like that's one of those quotes that just just lives with me and I think that's where you know something horrible happens or so there's violence I mean God does not will that Mm -hmm. but God is always trying to draw good out of it and that's where I think we can't just say like we're done you know we we have to own it we have to be part of that process of having good be brought out of it and part of that is to acknowledge once when we're not acting (laughs) with kindness and goodness as you have to do in an individual life absolutely and i think that you know the terminology can come and go if everybody in the world said i'm spiritual i'm not religious that's fine so you can still have the church there it's just got new framework around it you know so anyway (laughs) very very interesting stuff we we're happy to sort of answer your question there (laughs) um okay let's let's take a look at another one this is from Evelyn on YouTube. I love Swedenborg's teachings. Can you help me wrap my mind around the thought that angels are human beings? How about Gabriel who announced that Mary will give birth to Jesus? Yeah, and this is something that I kind of I find that does give people pause. It's this idea that, that Swedenborg has that every everybody in the afterlife was once a person. Um, so that the angels are people who are, you know, have really 
put a lot of work in and God is pulling them up into a higher and higher mindset. Um, and so some people find that, you know, some people are like, oh yeah, that, that makes sense. Other people that conflicts with what they may have experienced or learned or heard. Well, one thing I want to say about Gabriel is Swedenborg has this interesting concept about the, the sort of named angels in the Bible, um, you know, Michael, those kinds of, that those aren't individual angels. Um, those are sort of functions of angels. So he'll, like Michael, I believe, is like uh, defending truth or something mm-hmm. like that. So he, it, Michael is like a job description, you know, and he, I'm, I'm describing it simply, but he has these, this interesting, you know, theology behind it. But so, you know, it's not just like there's, there's all these angels, but some of them are super important. You know, it's like, oh, I, w- what do you do? Oh, I'm, I'm Michael. It's not that you would say it, but that's what it symbolizes when you hear. So there's Gabriel that, that announced it. I don't know if it's a person or what, but this would be some kind of function that, that a lot of different angels um, serve. So those are my first thoughts. Did you have? Well, you st- kind of stole everything I was going to say. So oh, that was just just yeah. say it again. We'll edit yeah, my part. Yeah, that's right. Okay. But I mean, just to just to build on that. I mean, one of the things my understanding is that those angels that are named. Um, I love the idea of the job description. Also, are like a community of. Mm-hmm. And I think about uh, the qualities. So, Swedenborg talks about how after death we are we are what remains of of the the things that um, it's it's about not about specific physicality it's about the quality of our life and who we are and our spirit and so it's it's like well so what was the quality of of gabriel or michael mm-hmm. and it's people that have a love and a desire um to be in that and to serve in that way that that's and i don't know i mean who knows how does it work i don't know i wasn't there when mary yeah. and gabriel were there no, me neither. but but what i think that the the wisdom that we can draw from that is um what was that interaction and what was the message and the good that was trying to be done in that yep and as we were saying in the beginning uh it's all about doing good so people can have plenty of shades of opinion on what are angels where do they come from what do they do as long as we're all trying to love each other and be good we're on the same team yeah. Amen. Yeah. All right. So let's let's take a look at another uh, question. This is from Penny on Facebook. My question is: What about atheists? I know several people who profess to be an atheist, and I have a hard time with that. How can you not believe in anything aside from yourself? I find it confusing and, to be honest, repulsive. Answers. Well, we give answers, so you <laughs> right right spot. So I, you know, when I first started doing like, as I said before, I work for a nonprofit group, but I talk about all kinds of religious stuff. So I and effectively waded into the religious conversation on YouTube, on Facebook, all that. And I, I didn't really, this is where I sort of met like the sort of modern atheism and that kind of thing. I would say that we have all these sort of terms and sort of this show is about religion and is it what people think it is and that kind of thing and the primary driver for a lot of um a lot of anti-religionism is how bad religion is Mm -hmm. there's a sort of a one conversation is the reaction to religion the other one is people who are wondering about the probability of does is there actually a divine being or is there any evidence for that you know um but i sort of see these multiple conversations and yeah and i think everybody's like, and I'll try not to steal everything that can be said I again. Um, everybody's life is so different. And what concepts mean to you, it's all based on your experiences and these kinds of things. So to some people, you know, it's like people, oh, I, God saved me here. Like I was I was addicted to this. I was something. How could anyone ever live without it? To other people, um, the, for, the, the landscape is different in their mind, you know. And so to them, what saying, I don't believe in in God, it, it's a different feeling. It's a different thing than other people. So it's just about us trying to figure out or to realize, man, life is really different in different people's minds. Um, and I've met plenty of uh, people who are calling themselves atheists who are very nice um, and not nice and same with religious people. Yeah. So I I think, anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I was just thinking, um, one of the things I like to say is that we're human first. And so before any other classifications go on, I would like to, like, how can I see the humanity of another person? And that comes out of my personal religious conviction, but that's that's the first question, Mm -hmm. is, okay, so this is another human being standing in front of me. How do I see their humanity? And then, so, I mean, something to talk about in my congregation is, like, everyone is welcome, and that includes anyone in any belief state so if you're an atheist but you want to come hang out at the garden church like that's cool like my job isn't to to change anything about that you're human first yeah. um 
So I think it's really important to acknowledge that because I think it's easy. I mean, it's easy to it's like really slippery slope as people who do have religious convictions to say like, well, you know, that's nice and all, but we really have the right answers. I, yeah. You know, that right. being said, um, often I think I mean, one of the conversations I've had with a lot of people who are like exploring more from what you were talking about, with, like the reactionary side mm-hmm. is to ask like, well, what God don't you believe in? And often when they list like, the God that they don't believe in, I'm like, yeah, I don't believe in that God either, right. you know? And so I think our concept of God is so crucial and key to our understanding of ourselves and each other and I mean, conditions. So, um, and the selfishness question, I mean, I I think we're all pretty, can be really pretty selfish. And yes, except I do, for me. Except for Curtis. <laughs> Just kidding. Absolutely. Um, but uh, so, I think that whatever can lead us towards being more loving, kind, compassionate people, um, let's do that and lean into that. And as for me, that comes from a faith perspective and place. Um, And I think that's important. Like, I I don't soft sell that I believe in God and I believe God is is a source and power of life in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, But that doesn't change that we need to love and respect every human who we encounter yeah and it's not such a binary thing like there are some people who believe in god there's some people who don't like if i'm cleaning my fish tank and this really happened and so you get all this like gross fish tank water in a bucket and you're like okay i'm gonna lift it out and it hits the side of your fish tank stand and water spills all over your floor is it really a god you know like you, that does flash through the mind or if i <laughs> i'm like here talking about you know um and but you know I can I'm here talking about oh so you know Swedenborg says this and if I step back I think I do think about it but I'll often be like trying to plot the trajectory of my life you know which is implicitly a distrust in the governance of God so what I'm saying is I think people go through all kinds of ups and downs about it you know so it's not that as simple as and of, you know, of course many people know that some people believe or don't believe like it's a one or a zero absolutely you know? and you know I think that's another thing that um, if we can let go of the the fence or the marker point being belief, I think there needs to be a space for questions. I mean, do I believe in God every moment of every day? I, I don't know. What does that even mean? Yeah, what would that feel right? like? Right? Like, what would yeah. that feel like? And I mean, I think particularly through in tragedy and loss and dark places, like, there are times where this is, this is a very real visceral question. Mm-hmm. And if somebody's arrived at that place, um, I'd like to know their story. You know, I'd like yeah. to have that conversation because I just, I don't think... It's it's nuanced. It's complicated, yeah. and um, you're welcome for me teaching you that. Word. Oh yeah, that, oh yeah, that was a new one. <laughs> um, so yeah, I question. totally. And you know, we could probably go on about this forever, but okay. I would say like the way that you know Swedenborg def- has all these special terms that mean special things in his work, and he'll talk about atheists, but to him, there, there's sort of this like, oh, religious is doing what's good, you know. So it's not necessarily so. There's a whole nuance to that. Also, yeah. in Swedenborg, he talks continually about God is eleven wisdom. Yeah. So, you know, if 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 you know, we talk a lot about like God is love, but like, what if love is God? Yeah. If love is God, do you believe in love? Yeah. Who knows? Who knows how it all works? But however it works, it's good. Um, something like that. Or not. Or it's not good. One of the two. So, all right, we uh, do we have one more? Okay, we're gonna do our last one here. Uh, and this is from Breath of Angels on YouTube. Love is my religion. I've had bad experiences with church and cults. I suppose now I am rather introverted and reserved when it comes to belonging or joining or going to any church. I love this group, though. Well, thanks very much. We're really glad to have you here. Uh, and I would say I appreciate you sharing that you've had those sort of hard experiences because it can be kind of a personal thing. And I think a lot of people have been scarred by deeply scarred by religion and cults, all kinds of things in a lot of ways. And it's important to acknowledge that. And that's why I like the model, like, you you know, you, you're saying that you enjoy this group. You know, this group is like, we're not in charge of anyone. We barely know the answers to these questions. Um, uh, and I like that. I like the feel of it. And you're saying that there's a similar kind of vibe at, at your church. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's part, to me, that's part of reimagining church. And that's what you're doing here. We're reimagining how do we come together mm-hmm. and be in community to be people that are loving God or loving love and goodness yeah. and being useful to each other. So yep. I think it's, this is this is the future of the church, future of religion, right here, this right is, now. This starts today. Um, Brother of Angels, we love having you.
in this group and we appreciate that question everybody thanks for the excellent questions we're gonna get to a quick video break then we'll come back with our correspondences meditation all right so we do it every week we're gonna do it again this week Correspondences, try to do a sort of an experiential thing. Basically, from what I understand, correspondences is where you can see, perceive images of deeper spiritual realities in physical objects. You know, we were talking a bit about plants, you know, and your church is kind of based around gardening and plants, and Swedenborg would say that, that you know, those are images of things like the, the mind, the human psyche, those kinds of things. So today we're going to be looking at seeds, because I thought that has to do with it, with the garden and everything. And um, I know that Swedenborg will talk about seeds as an image of potential. We, we made a short video um, about how he, he actually ha goes on this little riff about, um, you know, a seed is an image of God's infinity because one seed can lead to a flower that again produces seeds. And if those all survive on and on, you'd have this infinite growth and that that's kind of an image of God and and the seed is a potential of like a concept in the mind that, that can grow. So what what do what is seeds? What does that mean to you in a sort of a spiritual sense? Yeah. Um, well, you you said a lot of it. I think the idea of potential really mm -hmm. strikes me. And you know, I was just thinking, um, you know, here we are at the start of a new year, the one this is being taped, you know, it's January. Yeah. And um, in some climates, it's it's cold. Like right now we're in a the Philadelphia area and yeah. it's cold out. I'm just here for the weekend. Mm -hmm. I'm usually out in California where it's warm. But when we talk with people about like literally like spring and that that hope that that's actually something that God is always implanting in us, that there's always like, what is that thing? That thing that just like grabs you and gives you that idea of potential. And I think that, I don't know, for myself, um, having hope grows, like grabbing some, just one little thing, one little idea, one little truth, and being able to hold on to that and knowing that that, that is what God is infusing and infilling and is committed and that when you know the little mustard seed grows into that huge tree right um, and that that's what God's doing in our spiritual lives as well so so take all those thoughts we just said have them kind of in your mind hold them loosely we'll be looking at these images here and just sort of see if thinking about that these these pictures of seeds we're seeing are like visual images of the concepts we're talking about just see what what comes to you and we'll be back in a minute sheet and like put salt on them and cook them very very delicious that would mean something too uh thank you guys for watching today if you want to help support this show help it spread and grow uh open up the description of the video you can make a small paypal donation it will actually get matched five to one so it'll really help us out thanks for considering it also while you have that description box open you can check out anna's church we have a link to it there Anna, thanks so much for being on the show thanks so much for having me all right and we hope to have you back again soon everybody else will be back next Monday. See you.